Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today and joining us for beginner's guide to land sector and removals guidance. Um, we are going to just wait a few minutes here for people to trickle in and we'll get started um, in just a few. So hold tight, grab any water you want and uh, we'll get started shortly. All right, wonderful. Had a good few more people trickle in and join, so welcome for those who just joined. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started here as this session is recorded and so will be available to be viewed later for anyone who is uh, just jumping in now. Um, but we've got some great content to get to today. Um, would love to go ahead and jump in. So officially welcome everyone. Um, today uh, we have a introduction session on the land sector and removals guidance. Um, we are hosting this today now as there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of questions on the land sector removal guidance, the draft guidance that's been issued and when the official guidance will be issued uh, next year. And so um, in all these questions that we've been having, we wanted to just give an introduction um, for a beginner's guide. So uh, today we're going to be going over and covering uh, some of the basic elements with uh, a few deep dives on some of the topics and to best understand what we know so far on the land sector and removals guides. So if you please go to the next slide. Wonderful. Um, well, thank you all so much for joining. Um, my name is Colin Tompkinsberg, and I'm a senior key account manager here at South Pole. Um, I've been with South Pole for the last couple of years and work with companies um, across their climate journey in providing them with services to help them decarbonize, as well as opportunities to help fund climate action. Prior to being at South Pole, I uh, worked at startups um, and helping them uh, make more sustainable supply chains. Um, and really been enjoying to be able to continue to do so with a lot more uh, breadth of services for companies all across the world. I'm joined uh, by my two wonderful colleagues, Shelby Smith and Olivia Novak, both consultants on our agricultural value chains team. And they will be, I'll be handing off them both shortly. And so I'll let themselves do a brief little introduction um, when we get over to their slides. Uh, so that, next slide. Before diving into our deep dive on the land sector removal guidance, just want to give everyone a bit of a context as to who we are uh, here at South Pole and kind of where this information is coming from. Um, so in the first introduction to South Pole, uh, we have been around since 2006 and based in Zurich, Switzerland. And over the last 16 years, uh, have really exploded in growth to now over a thousand uh, employees in over 20 countries. And so here in this map, you can see some of our physical presence um, as both employees and offices, and also um, projects, climate, uh, carbon projects that uh, we've been funding with all of our associations and partners. We have two primary uh, parts of our uh, business, our climate projects and climate solutions team. Our climate project side of the business is really helping companies fund climate action in a wide variety of different climate projects ranging from renewable energy to uh, cook stoves, community projects, uh, afforestation, reforestation, 
um, and really leveraging ex our expertise of over 300 um, penguins, as we call ourselves in the South Pole, uh, to develop and fund those climate projects, uh, as you can see in the green in this map below. Our second part of our business is, is in the climate solutions, and that's a uh, part we're going to talk about today. And uh, we've grown into 10 different practices, uh, one of which is our agriculture value chains team. And each of these practices really helps companies across their climate journey um, really advance in their climate journey in doing greenhouse gas accounting, setting their targets, and finding ways to actually decarbonize their overall profile. And so we have over 500 experts uh, globally uh, working on these climate solutions and working with um, companies to help advance them in their climate journey. A little more specifically, uh, as I mentioned, we're here with our agriculture value chains team. Next slide, please. Which is made up of experts uh, across the globe. Um, we have around 50 different members specifically focusing on working with companies who have an agricultural value chain. And specifically, uh, as there are many different nuances that companies face in regards to how to work with their suppliers, their large uh, amount of scope uh, emissions being in scope three, and of course now uh, with the flag targets and now land sector removals guidance. And so finally, bringing to our topic of today, uh, South Pole and a lot of the members of our agricultural value chains team have actually been heavily involved in the development of the land sector removals guidance. Uh, we've been a supporting partner in both hosting workshops and actually piloting uh, the draft guidance with a number of, of companies and really offering our expert advice on how best uh, for this uh, guidance to be developed. Um, and so today uh, we're basically going to be going over uh, some of the overall uh, beginner steps and guides to what we know so far uh, and what companies can really understand and start to contextualize for what this means for their business. And so with that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Shelby Smith to really start to deep dive us into the land sector removal guidance. So Shelby, over to you. Perfect. Hey, everyone. My name is Shelby, based in Bozeman, Montana. So for those of you not based in the US, it's kind of up in the Canadian border in the middle of the country. Um, I've been working on the agricultural value chains team at South Pole for about a year now, um, doing you know everything from our general road mapping process to diving really deep into land use change emissions recently and what no deforestation commitments mean. So the flag guidance is you know really the bread and butter of what we do here, and excited to dive into it with you today. Um, just some housekeeping: if you have questions throughout the presentation, um, feel free to drop them in the questions tab. We'll collate them, and then at the end of the presentation, we'll have you know, 15 minutes or so to go through uh, Q&A. So looking forward to hearing from you in that section. So a little bit about what we'll talk about today. Um, the land sector removal guidance, we know it's gonna impact various industries, including the traditional flag sectors like forest and paper producers, uh, processors, distributors, agricultural producers, food and bev, retailers, even the tobacco industry. So if you're here from one of those sectors, um, congratulations, you've landed in the right spot. Um, if you don't know what flag emissions are, that's okay too. We'll go through that today and talk about um, what that means. And if you are from a company that you know lands outside of the flag sector, you also might have to set flag targets if your uh, value chain emissions breach that 20% threshold. So you're in the right place also. Um, today we're gonna talk about how your company can achieve transparency and consistency in your land-related greenhouse gas accounting, science-based target roadmaps, and overall climate goals. So whether you're well on your way to net zero or in the first stages of your sustainability roadmap. Um, the land sector removals guidance will likely affect you um, and how you account for, report on, and interact with your climate goals. So today we'll be diving into uh, the differences between the land sector removals guidance and what that means for the science-based target initiative flag piece and how those two documents interact. Um, we'll talk through the company's mandated to set flag targets. Uh, we'll talk through the basics of land use change emissions as well as land management practice and removal. So hopefully this is a new piece that dives a little bit into the technical details of that, but um, later on in the next six months, we hope to host a more technical session where we can go through those topics in depth. Um, and finally, we'll get to kind of key takeaways from the land sector and removals guidance that your company should factor in um, for its future strategies. So without further ado, let's jump in. So we've got these documents here. Um, the ones on the left are the Greenhouse Gas Protocol Land Sector and Removals Guidance, um, but also very interconnected is the Science-Based Target Initiative Forest Land and Agricultural um, Target Setting Guidance. So basically the science-based target, it's trying to align limiting global warming to the 1.5 degrees Celsius um, compared to pre-industrial levels. 
And the greenhouse gas protocols land sector and removals guidance on the left hand side provides you with the how to component of how to account for emissions and removals um, in this sector specifically in order to reach your company's science based targets. So very interconnected documents here. Um, the greenhouse gas protocol and sector removals guidance is in draft form that came out in September 22 um, and still waiting on kind of figuring out when that's going to progress into its finalized form. There's still some stakeholder talks going on there. Um, we've heard kind of Q1 of next year might be a target date for that, but that'll shift as you know the guidance develops as well, um, or it could potentially shift. So the SBTI flag guidance, on the other hand, was finalized in October of uh, 2022. And implementation timelines are recently updated, and we'll get to that later on. But just knowing these two documents are super interconnected, one's more of the how-to of to do the accounting for it, and the other one is the target setting piece. So first question is, does my company need to set a FLAG target? And FLAG as an acronym refers to forest, land, and agriculture. So we'll refer to it as FLAG in this document, and you'll hear that pretty popularly, um, but know that that's what that stands for. So. There's a list of designated flag sectors um, within SBTI. So you'll see the list there. Um, and if you're in one of those sectors, yes, you must set a flag target. Um, it's important to know that if you fall in sectors outside of that, you also might be held liable to um, set flag targets as well. So if your emissions within the flag sector are that of 20% or greater of your total emissions, um, you'll have to set a flag target as well. So like I said, you're in the right place if you're in one of these sectors, if you're not in one of these sectors specifically, but believe that your um, processes have a lot of potential land um, emissions as well, we could talk about flag. So let's get some tangible examples here. So coffee company that buys coffee from global suppliers and distributes globally, um, they're not in the business of producing coffee themselves. They get coffee from farmers and then they're kind of the aggregator that sells globally. Um, would they have to set a science-based target? Uh, for flag? And the answer is yes. Um, they are a direct SBTI designated flag sector uh, in the food and staples retailer bucket. The second one is a mining company, which you wouldn't think necessarily fits within the designated flag sectors, but it's likely that this company's flag emissions are over 20% of their total emissions. So um, essentially what we do is kind of a back of the napkin assessment and say, okay, do we think they'll have to account for flag? Um, would that part of the emissions be over 20% and then we go from there. And that's kind of how we operationalize thinking through if you need to set a flag target or not um, before diving into it. The third one is a clothing company whose raw materials are mostly cotton and wool. Um, it's likely that this company would also have to set flag targets because cotton and wool being raw materials are land-based ingredients, so likely meaning over 20% of their total emissions. Awesome. So before we really dive into what land use change is, I think we need to talk about carbon stocks and just what carbon pools are and how they're related to um, this whole topic. And I, I'm a scientist at heart, so diving into the science first and then trying to operationalize it makes a lot of sense in my head. So hopefully it does for you all too. Um, when you're looking at this tree diagram, it's pretty simple. There are just different sources of carbon that are held in different places within um, our forest and soils and whatnot. So you've got below ground biomass, which is rooty material, above ground biomass, which is the traditional leafy material. Dead organic man matter also holds a lot of carbon. And then there's soil organic carbon as well. So the ingrained soil um, or the, the carbon particles within that soil as well. So these are all areas where carbon is stored within our um, you know, trees, lands, grasslands, um, and soils and whatnot. So thinking about how our practices and how our businesses either detract or add to that carbon stock, that's what this flag guidance is mostly focused on. So just a little scientific grounding there. Um, when we talk about land use change emissions, it's basically understanding the net change from you know, one carbon stock to another carbon stock. Are we losing carbon when we change from a forest to a cropland? Are we gaining carbon when we start reforestation efforts and whatnot? So these are the four carbon pools to be aware of. Um, and the amount of carbon in each of these carbon pools really differs based on the ecosystem. So when we're thinking about, you know, going from one land type to another, it's really important to understand the, not only the beginning land type, but also the end land type and the ecosystem involved. And then within the land sector and removals guidance, all pools need to be accounted for. So we'll go through the requirements of it, but just understanding that it's not enough just to measure the soil organic carbon, rather these four carbon pools are what's important as well. 
So land-based emissions occur when land use change happens or land management practices change. Um, and basically this results in a flux of these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere as the carbon stocks change. So land use change is one of the larger topics within land sector and removals guidance that people um, kind of zoom in on, but want to make you aware that land management also can have carbon stock changes as well. So for land use change, a classic example is what happens when we take a forest, um, chop it down and turn it into cropland, for example. So I would say like Brazil, prime example of this. What happens when we need more pasture for cows or we need, you know, to grow more soy to feed those cows? Um, we would cut down trees and then, you know, produce a cropland as a result. So what this does is changes a lot of those carbon stocks and leads to a loss of carbon. Um, and this forest um, land and agricultural guidance helps us figure out how to account for those changes and where to report them and things like that. Land management, for example, um, it's not necessarily you are changing land types, it's rather you're changing the practice that goes on. So say you start tilling a soil, um, that has obvious impacts for soil organic matter, um, as well as can for the dead organic biomass as well. Um, and then when we think about kind of prescribed burning or manure management, all of these are practices that change uh, the carbon stocks that happen on our lands. So deep dive into the land use change emissions piece. So we'll go into that top piece first. Um, this is a classic diagram from the land sector removals guidance. I find it super useful to understand you know, when we might be gaining or losing carbon as a result of changing our practices. So, um, for example, the classic one would be changing from, you know, uh, forest to cropland. And you can see that is the, the top row, the third bucket there. Um, the pink categories are where land use change leads to carbon stock losses. Um, and then the blue are where land management um, or land use change can lead to carbon stock gains. So as we switch from one category to a different category, I always find this is a really helpful table to go back on and try to figure out, um, you know, exactly is carbon lost during the process or gained. And there are a lot of variabilities within that, but this is like a good way to categorize it at a very high level. Um, you will see subcategories here. I find the forest ones specifically useful. So if you're moving from a natural forest to a planted forest, um, that's seen as carbon stock losses as well. So just different components to be aware of in here. Land management emissions. Um, so let's talk about what activities can impact carbon stocks. And we talked a little bit about prescribed burning as an example or tilling. Um, here's a list of some other ones. So session selection, fire management, um, yeah, tilling, residue management, crop rotations. Um, all of these practices lead to different emissions. So as you can see in the diagram on the right, um, rice cultivation, certain practices lead to the release of more methane, for example. So being aware of all of these carbon stock changes as we change our practices on our field um, is very important because you can increase or decrease and that can affect your carbon budgets um, and GHG accounting along the way. So I'd be remiss not to talk about the two categories of working towards more sustainability, which we model in our roadmaps is either reductions or removals. Um, I think it's really important to separate the two because as you can see on the bottom, like one's way more simple to calculate, one's a lot more technical. Um, we'll dive into the removal side of things um, later on, but basically emission reductions are projects that lower the ingrained carbon in your activities. So say you work with your suppliers to reduce fertilizer in your process. Um, that's gonna be a carbon emission reduction. So these reductions don't sequester carbon, rather they reduce its release to the atmosphere. So think of things like reducing fertilizer use, reducing pesticide use, um, or adding in something like a feed additive that reduces enteric fermentation and methane release. So that's on the reduction side. The removal side gets a bit more complicated and I've dropped an IPCC definition here um, just because I think it's really important that we all align on the definition of removals. Um, but basically, it's an anthropogenic activity that removes CO2 from the atmosphere and durably stores it. And I will highlight the durably stores it part of that, um, as we'll dive into the implications of that later on. Um, removals can be super rewarding for this industry to start calculating, but they definitely require a more technical accounting and reporting framework um, as well. And we'll dive into the requ requirements there. But in the land sector and removals guidance, um, this is all outlined. So. It's a good place to look if you are thinking about calculating removals and trying to you know, bring those into your GHG accounting frameworks to reduce some of the emissions um, that the company is responsible for. So 
deep dive into removals, what are removals? Let's all get on the same page about that first. So um, basically, when you are storing carbon and pulling it from the atmosphere and then creating long-term storage for it, that's a removal. There are two types here. There's biogenic removals and then technological removals. Um, biogenic, you can think is like farm practices that would sequester carbon um, dur during that process. So we can think of afforestation, reforestation, or soil carbon sequestration, um, where atmospheric CO2 is being transferred into a biogenic carbon pool. So soil, for example, or um, like woody biomass in a tree, for example, or vine. Uh, technological removals, that's something that I don't necessarily dabble in so much in the agricultural space, but I will suggest that these exist, such as enhanced weathering and direct air capture and things like that. So that's more of the energy and industry side of the removals piece, but today we'll focus mostly on the biogenic removals part of this. So big question here, why bother accounting for land-based removals? So the land sector and removals guidance improves the completeness of carbon inventories, allowing companies to finally include these land-based and product-based removals in their accounting. Um, I think this is a super important piece of this guidance. So, you know, uh, capturing both the reductions and the removal side of it is important. So SBTI states that carbon offsets, such as purchase carbon credits, don't count towards reaching a company's SBT, but removals are kind of an interesting way to start accounting for, you know, what kind of carbon are we sequestering during these processes that our companies are um, actively engaged in? So um, companies can include removals within their supply chains to reduce their net carbon emissions within their flag targets. And this can be really advantageous for the flag sector as many interventions that can be implemented um, can increase removals as a goal. So some of these, you know, reforestation projects with on, within crop fields, like think about silvopasture or think about implementing regenerative agriculture and the impacts that has to soil organic carbon. So we can capture removals and reduction from some of these practices. Um, let's think about examples of reduction and removals and kind of make this a little bit more tangible. So the first one would be that same coffee company that sources coffee from suppliers globally, um, but they don't necessarily grow any of the coffee themselves. Um, say this company wants to, you know, work towards net zero, what are they going to do? Um, if they want to implement an agroforestry program within their suppliers and they're incentivizing their suppliers to plant trees on their coffee farms, um, let's say in this hypothetical example, like farmers use less fertilizer because of this, because the, the tree that they've planted sequesters more or keeps more nutrients bioavailable for the coffee plant farmers find, oh, okay, we don't actually need to fertilize these crops as much near these tree sources. That would be on the reduction side of things. Um, but you can also think of that same tree used for agroforestry as sequestering carbon in the soil as well, and that would count towards the removal. So there's an example of a practice that would count for both the reductions and removal side of this. A second one would be a global beef company that wants to source beef, well, that is sourcing beef from across the globe, um, understanding that their operations have significant land use change emissions associated with it because this cattle that we're particularly talking about uses soy feed. Um, and that soy feed could be linked to deforested land. So if a company decides to switch their feed from soy that's related to deforestation to you know, a supplier that is in a country with low deforestation risk, that could be seen as a mission reduction project. So you're not sequestering soil by you know, switching suppliers here, but you are reducing the land use change emissions that are um, associated with your supply chain. Third example would be back to that clothing company that makes cotton and wool products. Um, say this company wants to start implementing regenerative agriculture. So practices like no-till or cover cropping into their suppliers' um, fields. And you know, when you do cover cropping or no-till, oftentimes we see that this reduces the need for fertilizer or pesticide application. Um, this would fall into the bucket of the reduction. And then as we're doing no-till practices, we are sequestering carbon in the soil. Um, depending on the location, it has different soil sequestration effects, but this piece of it can be seen as a removal. So hopefully this gives you a good idea across three different companies or industries, what a reduction and a removal would look like. So as I was mentioning, removals have very technical reporting requirements. And I'll jump to a slide um, right after this that kind of walks through exactly what the requirements are. But at a very high level, some questions to ask are, is there operational, organizational, or financial control of the area? Um, if yes, then we can move on. 
are the lands managed versus unmanaged? Um, if the answer is yes, if, it, if the lands are managed, we can move on. If the answer is no, then we cannot report removals in that area. And then a piece of the reporting for removals that's like a super stringent requirement is the access to primary data. So we really want to understand at the carbon stock level where this is happening, what's the change? And if there's no primary data on it, at this moment, we're not able to calculate the removals. Um, but if we do have access to primary data, um, we can move forward and try to calculate removals based on the following requirements. So I'll jump into those. Um, this is a little bit beefy of a slide, so I'm not going to go through all of it. But essentially, that first bucket is saying that you have to account for all life cycle emissions here, um, and then biogenic and non-biogenic. Um, removals and reductions have to be accounted for separately. So um, this is an important thing to think about when inventories are being created or you're trying to capture the benefits of a project. Say you're working with a supplier that's doing a, a reductions project for you. Um, if they come back and say, okay, yeah, here's the, the GHG savings that we've accomplished in this project in terms of reduction banner rules, you could say, hold on, I need them separated because this guidance requires that separation to report. Um, we can account for scope one and scope three removals based on the annual net carbon stock changes occurring in the reporting year. Um, there is the stock change accounting method, which is detailed in the land sector and removals guidance. Um, and like I was saying, the greenhouse gas protocol and sector and removals guidance really is the how to on the accounting piece. So that's where I'd look for more details in the literal equation for stock change accounting. Um, a huge principle in this area that you know, gets touched upon and makes people nervous, but quite frankly, I think it's an opportunity to really ensure permanence um, for removals projects are the principles of permanence and conservativeness. Um, there are a lot of requirements here regarding ongoing storage monitoring, monitoring um, the traceability in which you need to account for the removals, um, primary data accessibility. Um, we have to take a conservative approach to uncertainty under this guidance. And then there's a concept of reversals, which is if you can't do the ongoing, ongoing storage monitoring or something like that, um, and that chain of uh, information is broken, you'll actually have to account for the reversal of the removal you accounted for um, during that given year. So as I was saying, the land sector removals guidance is a really good place to look for the reporting and accounting uh, requirements that are quite lengthy for the removal side of things. One thing I quickly wanted to touch on is that removals can be reported under different scopes. So there can be scope one removals and scope three removals, which is really interesting. Um, again, if there's no ongoing, ongoing storage um, or if the removal requirements aren't met, the really stringent ones, we can account for that as a removal. So understanding that when you're building projects and looking to account for removals, just make sure to look towards the land sector and removals guidance to make sure you're meeting all the requirements as we move along. Take a brief pause here for a sip of water, but closing remarks, we're going to talk about the key takeaways um, and kind of, you know, what's next for all of us. Okay, so the first one is we're going to use stock change accounting um, because of the land sector and removals guidance as it's really helpful in achieving transparency in emissions reporting. So it's helping us account for the net emissions and removals going off. So Key takeaway from the land sector and guidance or land sector and removals guidance is definitely look into that section when you're going through the accounting um, phase of this. South is happy to help and support in either upscaling or completing this task for you and your company, but this is a good source of information to look um, for details on this. The next one is reporting the GHG emissions and removals by scope, gas, and carbon stock. Um, there's just really high traceability requirements here. So this is getting at inventory uh, traceability and transparency. And I think it's really important, but understanding kind of the requirements as a result of the land sector and removals guidance, um, definitely take a look at that. Um, this is a great place to look for information on that topic. Um, reporting emissions on all managed lands, including emissions from natural disturbances um, for all the lands within a company's organizational boundaries, including leased assets, franchisees, and investments. Um, this is an important one, thinking about removals and thinking about emissions on managed versus unmanaged lands. There's definitions included in the land sector and removals guidance that will be important to dig into um, when you're thinking about the emissions that you're reporting during this time. And we suggest start starting by reporting um, director statistical land use change emissions. 
um, you will have to calculate land use change emissions um, because of the land sector and removals guidance. So either the statistical way is a good way to start this process um, when there's low traceability or you're just getting into it. Um, direct land use change emissions calculations require a bit more data, um, but it really requires, so it requires a lot of traceability to the area of production essentially, but um, using direct land use change calculations can be really beneficial for companies that are trying to say, look, actually my areas, we've deforested a lot less land than the statistical average of the company we're source or the country we're sourcing from. So um, there are differences here to dive into. Um, and then just touching briefly on the assessment period of 20 years. So when land use change happens as a result of the land use uh, or land sector removals guidance, um, this will be have to be accounted for for 20 years. So thinking about the impacts of land use change over a long scale of time is now a requirement. Um, within this guidance, there's a land tracking metric trying to understand that, you know, what impact does the company that you're working for have on the greater land use change emissions, kind of from like a statistical economic standpoint. So not necessarily what's happening on your lands, but how is what's happening on your lands affect the area around you. So there are three different land tracking metrics you can choose from. Um, land occupation is definitely the easiest one to calculate, um, but there are quite a other few as well, such as like indirect land use change, and then um, I think there's a cost one as well. The last one is, we've harped on this a lot, there are specific requirements to report removals, including ongoing monitoring, the traceability, the primary data and whatnot. So stranger requirements there, I'm happy to have a deeper chat about the requirements, but they're pretty well outlined in the guidance, uh, but they definitely have implications for how you would report removals. I want to talk through the projected challenges for corporate's inventory accounting. Um, as we've started working with this guidance and learning more and more about it, there are recurring points that I think are interesting to bring up as everyone's starting to think through, you know, how will we implement this guidance um, for our inventory accounting? So supply chain traceability, that's a tough one. And that's one that everyone's struggling with. Um, to report the scope three land removals, you have to have traceability back to the harvested area. Um, or the land management unit. So I think a perfect first step for companies is really to dive into that traceability piece. Um, there, as I mentioned, there are a ton of benefits in reporting removals, but making sure that your reporting systems or internal systems have the level of data needed to meet those requirements um, from a traceability perspective, that's a really good place to start on this. Incorporating primary data, it's pretty tricky in this as well. Um, we've seen companies really struggle with this. So it a lot, the guidance allows a certain flexibility in emissions accounting approaches um, and removals accounting are optional. And I wanna stress that point. Um, not everyone's gonna be able to do this immediately, um, but incorporating primary data into these calculations can kind of help refine from, you can start with a statistical perspective, like, hey, we're sourcing beef from Brazil or, you know, later down the line, once you gain more traceability into this, you can start incorporating your primary data, like, okay, the area I source from, from Brazil has a low, you know, land use change or deforestation um, risk compared to the total Brazilian beef market. So incorporating primary data can be really beneficial for showing that you have lower emissions than let's say your competitors or the general surroundings. Um, but gathering that primary data can be a challenge and it's a good place to start um, if you're thinking about how am I gonna dive into this. The spatial and temporal uh, variability in sourcing is really interesting. So the land management piece is an interesting piece of it. So, you know, the lands that are managed for production can change over time. So understanding where your crops are grown and how that changes in between years and if you are saying, you know, I use regenerative agriculture to grow soy in 2018, for example, and you want to calculate removals for that, say that area changes and you no longer are in operational control of that field that originally used those practices, you'll have to conduct reversals accounting in that area. So really stressing that point of traceability and primary data and just knowing exactly where you source from and what's been happening on that land um, and what's going to continue to happen to that land in the future. So I'll close with this final slide on the bottom line. Um, the land sector and removals guidance, it's a very robust framework for accounting for emissions and removals. 
Um, I think we talked a lot about the removal side of it today, but the emission side of it is very well detailed as well. So if you have emissions in the forest, land and agriculture sector, this framework, this framework will be an absolutely helpful guide for you in figuring out how to do the accounting or how to start thinking about this. Um, this guidance is super helpful for getting transparency and consistency in the land related GHG accounting. So really the point of this guidance is to get everyone on the same page in these sectors to start reporting in a similar way. Um, we've seen it challenging for companies to engage with their value chains on this sort of stuff. So getting that traceability is tricky, but it's a fantastic place to start. Everyone's going through it right now. Um, so it, I think I'll be very interested to see how traceability um, increases over time as a result of this guidance. And then final note is Q1 of 2024 is the expected release of the greenhouse gas protocol land sector and removals guidance as of now. Um, that's subject to change as it's a draft and it has to go through some stakeholder um, discussions as well to solidify some of the open questions. And then the implementation timelines for the SBTI um, flag are to follow. So that document's already finalized, but let's figure out when all that implementation is necessary. Thanks so much for hanging on and listening to you all. Um, now I'll open the floor to questions and my colleague Olivia will help me answer some of those as well. So thanks so much for tuning in. Thank you so much. That was very, very, very helpful. Understanding a lot of complex issues. Really appreciate you walking us through that. Um, as Shelby mentioned in the beginning of her talk, uh, we are open for questions. And so please uh, feel free to ask uh, any questions. But we do have, uh, I do have a few uh, for both Shelby and Olivia that I'm going to go ahead and start with. So please feel free to populate um, the questions in there. Um, Till then, got a few of my own. Um, either Shelby or Olivia. Do companies need to account for emissions on all lands that they are sourcing from and or manage? Great question. I think this is the question we get a lot because it gets a little lost uh, in the guidance sometimes. Um, but no, only lands that companies classify as managed currently. So the guidance allows companies to either one, classify all lands as managed, or two, develop um, and apply a consistent criteria to classify certain lands under their operational or organizational control as managed or unmanaged. For example, lands that only have an active, managed plan, active management plan on them. Um, and managed lands are where you would then account for the emissions and removals, um, well, possibly removals from the carbon stock changes that occur here. Awesome. Thank you very much, Olivia. Um, next question I have is, what level of traceability do companies need to report on their emissions and removals? Yeah, I think Shelby did a great job of summarizing some of the current guidance around this. Um, but for emissions, IPCC tier one um, emission factors are still aligned for reporting emissions. Um, again, as Shelby mentioned, the quality and the rigor of your reporting requirements changes a little bit uh, when you want to report something like removal. So the guidance is still being finalized on data quality requirements as well as traceability, whether they're going to allow companies who have only have traceability to say a sourcing region versus that land management unit that Shelby mentioned um, and whether those will be eligible for removals reporting in the end. So stay tuned, that decision is, is coming and um, South Pole has been very involved in that discussion. And yeah, we're excited to see where it goes. Thank you, Olivia. Um, as has been noted, obviously, it's just a lot changing and evolving. Um, this is everything we know now, and we'll hopefully uh, we'll be knowing more as soon as the actual official guidance is issued. Um, also, just like to mention now that this is our beginner's guide too, and in the next few months uh, we will be uh, hosting another webinar uh, once that guidance is released uh, to kind of deep dive a little further and to update on on where the guidance exactly has gone um, on a number of these issues. Um, next question I have is, what are the different carbon stocks that the guidance requires companies to report on? I can jump in for this one. So as we talked about, we've got biomass, which is above ground and below ground. Um, we've got dead organic matter and then soil carbon. So these stocks are impacted both by the land use change and the land management practices. And in the land sector and removals guidance, all of those carbon stocks will need to be accounted for along the way. And quickly, um, just wanted to mention that we have a great white paper up on our website that helps to summarize this 
uh, presentation. So if you have colleagues that are interested in kind of getting this high level beginners land sector and rules guidance crash course, um, feel free to look towards our blog post as Olivia has written a, a fantastic one to help summarize a lot of these things that's very shareable. Thank you so much for bringing that up, Shelby. Um, the next question I have here is coming from the audience and curious as to how does the guidance define primary data uh, and are there any gray zones within how they define it? Yeah, we get this. This is definitely a very popular question. Um, currently, the guidance defines primary data as data specific to a company's supply chain or value chain team or value chain. Uh, so meaning maybe like an in-house LCA um, or direct consumer data surveys. Uh, but again, uh, this is still pending final finalization in the guidance. And there is an active um, team working to try to see where we can meet um, scientific rigor of the guidance with um, practicality and feasibility to implement. So yeah, stay tuned for this as well. Wonderful. That uh, brings us to conclusion of all the questions for today. So thank you, Shelby and Olivia, for responding to those. Um, it's like we have one more that just came in. Let's see what we got going here. Um, okay, uh, this is regarding into zero deforestation. So Shelby and Olivia, please feel free to decline if you'd like, but companies also need to commit on zero deforestation. How should companies report on uh, their deforestation target? I think I'll let Shelby take that one. This is a great one. I've been involved in a lot of this recently, and it's been awesome to dive into the no deforestation aspect too. But yes, so no deforestation is required by the SBTI flag guidance. Um, essentially, there is a copy and paste statement right now that states um, company X has to commit to no deforestation for their, I think it's for their primary commodities that could be linked to deforestation by X target year. Um, and this is a statement that has a lot of implications and, you know, definitely a lot to dive into there, but no deforestation is now required under the SPTI flag guidance. Um, and actually the accountability framework initiative is a really helpful place to look if you're trying to understand what the implications of that are. Um, the SPTI defaults to their definition of no deforestation. So a helpful place to look there. Um, the organization is basically, I think, built on a bunch of different groups that have come together to align on the definition of no deforestation and operational guidance on how to move forward with creating a no deforestation supply chain. So definitely look at that. Um, there are some caveats such as uh, the SBTI guidance right now doesn't require you to set a no conversion target, rather just def no deforestation, but AFI has their list of best practices to include in um, within that, there's no conversion and then no peat burning also. So definitely look towards AFI if you're trying to figure out how to oper operationalize the no deforestation target piece of this. Awesome. Thank you, Shelby. Um, it's a great place to end uh, as we have this deep dive today on land sector removal guidance and removals in uh, supply chains. But as the deforestation comes up, um, that is definitely another topic that, that South Pole we work a lot uh, with other clients on. And so deforestation, land sector removal guidance, um, please feel free to uh, continue to reach out to us. Um, Shelby, if you wanna to go to the next slide there. Um, I have my email here as well as my colleague Amory's uh, email. And please feel free to reach out to either of us. Um, keep these questions coming. We'd be happy to get you in touch uh, with the right team, team member, get your responses answered. Um, and also just to, to finish off those last couple of plugs, um, there is a white paper out on the specific topic that uh, Olivia and Shelby both worked on on our website, which Shelby already mentioned. So that's another great resource to continue to uh, understand uh, this, this topic. And then as well, just be on the lookout um, in the next couple of months, we will be uh, hosting a next webinar on this exact topic. And so be on the lookout for that. Um, in the meantime, please feel to reach out for, for any more immediate inquiries and be happy to hear from you. So thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Shelby. And thank you everyone for attending today. Really appreciate it and hope you have a great rest of your day.